I have the great pleasure and privilege uh, to introduce uh, Shashi Thurur today, who uh, I count as a good friend in Delhi, but who is one of the great Renaissance men of modern India uh, and has led multiple lives uh, in, in, in remarkably uh, fast pace. Uh, one of the leading novelists of his generation, his, his book, The Great Indian Novel, is a, a landmark literary work written in his 20s. Early 30s. <laughs> By which stage he had already had a PhD at the age of 22. Two. Um, went on to um, uh, dazzling heights in the UN, um, nearly became, or stood for, Under Secretary General or Secretary General? No, no, I stood for Secretary General. Stood I was Under Secretary yeah. General. You were Under Secretary General and stood I, for I, Secretary General. I, but close but no cigar, as Groucho Marx would say. So <laughs> didn't make it. Um, then returned home to enormous uh, celebrity as a Congress politician in India, but uh, uh, Shashi, I think it's fair to say, is not naturally built for the constrictions of some aspects of modern Indian politics, where the last two or three Indian prime ministers prior to Mr. Modi have been almost completely silent uh, and never say anything. Shashi, by contrast, has, he told me this morning, 3.2 million Twitter followers uh, and uh, uh, broadcast to them on a very regular basis, uh, often uh, providing uh, uh, a certain self-generated generated uh, turbulence to your own political career, I think it's fair to say. Fair um, to say. Um, perhaps you might uh, quote a couple of your more famous tweets oh. that's got you in trouble over the years. Though. No, the, the worst <laughs> one probably was the one in which um, a, 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 a journalist rather mischievously asked when our government had announced an austerity drive, I was a minister in the government, Mr. Minister, does this mean you will now travel cattle class? <laughs> <laughs> to which I replied, absolutely, in cattle class, out of solidarity with all our holy cows, uh, which uh, <laughs> I thought was <laughs> relatively harmless, but uh, I mean, it, it, it led to uproar, not so much, you might be surprised to know, about the holy cows part, but actually about my using the expression cattle, cattle class, cattle. which they decided yeah. was unworthy of a, of a minister of the government of India because it implied I was equating economy class travelers to cattle. And while I tried to explain till I was blue in the face, this was an extremely common expression, uh, and that in fact it was, it was targeting the airlines for herding us all in like cattle rather than the passengers themselves, it led to rather eminent members of my own party calling for my resignation and a general kerfuffle that lasted for some time. And how many times have you got yourself sacked because of your tweets? <laughs> I'd rather not count, but anyway. But he always uh, comes back. He always comes back. And, I, and I'm not flattering him at all to say that he stands out head and shoulders above his rather timid uh, contemporaries uh, as, a, as an enormously intelligent, colourful, eccentric and uh, controversial figure. Um, but Not adjectives calculated to advance my career, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly, I mean, and, and it has, and it, it is a, a comment, in a sense, on the um, state of the uh, current Congress party, which is not known for its particular welcoming of criticism, particularly of its leadership, I think it's fair to say. I would ask you to comment on that. Um, uh, that uh, you currently remain, despite the fact there are only 50 M uh, Congress 44. M 44 Congress MPs left, uh, you remain without a ministerial, a shadow ministerial portfolio. But, but we don't have that system, you see. No one has a shadow ministerial portfolio because we, we don't allocate them. But in fact, I chair the Foreign Relations Committee, which is uh, not a bad thing because only eight opposition MPs chair committees, the rest are all with the government. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not too unhappy with my current role in Parliament. And uh, the committee, in any case, is where you get much more work done. So, no complaints. But most recently, and this is not on, on the agenda of this talk officially, but I think it would be remiss not to start with this, um, Shashi has come to international prominence oh. in the most unlikely circumstances of, of just joining a Oxford Union debate, which I say I, I turned down, having already done it with you at the Supreme Court in September, uh, which in retrospect was a huge mistake because uh, this has become a kind of, sort of epoch-making um, uh, event. And Shashi's... Uh, argument that the British Empire so impoverished India that the least we could do would be pay token the moral reparations of one pound a year for the next 200 years, uh, what not only won the debate, but went on to become an incredible viral. It's, it, it made even Mari Black's uh, uh, maiden speech look. Uh, Mari Black, we, had, we heard, had 12, 12 million retweets. You had... 
No, uh, on, sorry, on YouTube sorry. it's had about three and a half million sorry, views. So she had one point. What she had? Yeah. She had one point two. One point two, and you had three million and um, re- retweet, uh, retweets of your of your speech. Just perhaps, I mean, I think in this country it's fair to say that we're brought up with. Certainly, we have an education system which teaches us that many wicked things happen uh, in European, uh, by European nations abroad. But largely, it was Nazis um, oppressing other peoples, and and that we grew up with a rather fond idea that the British Empire was a relatively benign, benign. affair. That we built railways. That uh, uh, we weren't as bad as the Belgians, and uh, and were a lot better than those horrible Germans. Um, you gave a slightly different spin to that. You certainly weren't as bad as the Belgians, but that's a terribly low <laughs> yardstick, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, because of what they did in the Congo. No, I mean, my, my argument is very simply that um, the um, prosperity of Britain over the last 200 years was built on its depredations, on Britain's depredations in India. That Britain came to a prosperous India, which accounted for 23% of global GDP, and left it uh, accounting for 4%. Um, it destroyed uh, Indian industry, uh, which was principally textile manufacturing, um, by smashing the looms of the the famous Bengal weavers who wove muslin as fine as the woven air, it was said, uh, smashed their thumbs, absolutely smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, uh, and imported into Britain Indian raw materials such as cotton cloth and so on, and then exported the proceeds back to India. So India sank from having 27% of world exports to two by the time the British left. Um, uh, Frankly, dipped outrageously into the Indian treasury to prosecute the two world wars. Uh, it's been calculated that the sum total of material resources, not just the men uh, of whom uh, there were there were there were very large numbers in both world wars, but the material resources spent by the Indian public and Indian taxpayers and everything from cash to, 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 to clothing to munitions, uh, uh, animals, uh, food, uh, for the First World War alone amounts to eight billion pounds in today's money. Um, there was also the, the tragic cost uh, of the totally unnecessary famines visited upon India and British rule. Something like 15 to 29 million Indians lost their lives during these uh, years of British rule, including most egregiously the Great Bengal Famine of which is, 1943. Which you better explain because it's Well, not this was during the Second here. World War when um, a totally unnecessary famine was created by Winston Churchill's decision to divert food supplies from starving Bengalis uh, to Tommies in Europe who didn't actually need them because they actually went into European reserve stockpiles. And Churchill actually said, uh, unbelievably enough, that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered a good deal less than that of sturdy Greeks. That's an exact quote. And why wasn't Gandhi... Well, that was the last thing. When, when, (laughs) When appalled British officials, as people were dying around them like flies sent messages back or telegrams back to London uh, saying that these policies were costing lives and could they reverse the policies. Uh, Churchill's only comment was to write peevishly in the margin of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So, you know, to suggest that this was benign imperial conduct, this was typical, of course. um, I mean, the the language and the extremism were typical of Churchill, but the the conduct, I'm sorry to say, was 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 typical of, of um, uh, all colonial enterprises. Uh, the Jallianwala Bag massacre, more simply known as the Amritsar massacre, which took place in 1919, was another terrible example. Mahatma Gandhi had supported India's supporting Britain in the First World War uh, in exchange for what we expected would be dominion status. And there was a, a declaration made by the Secretary of State for India um, the so-called August announcement the year before the war ended in 1917, saying that uh, uh, at the end of the war, Britain would grant progressively responsible self-government. Uh, instead of which, Britain rewarded India with, uh, as, at the end of the war, with extremely stringent acts called the Rowlett Acts, which uh, uh, made arrest with, you know, and detention without trial so much easier, censored the Indian press, all sorts of things. And anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, protests against this led to even more repressive measures. And in the town of Amritsar in Punjab, General Dyer ordered that on a particular street where it had been said that an English woman had been assaulted, that every single Indian would have to crawl on all fours down the street. Now, this happened, uh, went on for a few days, and a large number of unarmed Indians gathered in an enclosed garden to protest this. Not one of them carried a weapon of any sort, not even a stick, let alone a gun. And Dyer surrounded the enclosed garden and opened fire. 
Uh, every single bullet claimed a victim. 1,700-odd people were killed. A further 1,300 were severely wounded. Uh, it, was, it was just something that, in many ways, uh, uh, dramatized the worst that colonialism could be. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything was like that. But there were these episodes, and colonialism and imperialism made them possible. On top of that, of course, you've got the fact that uh, the arguments made for Britain are actually rather specious. The railways you mentioned. Well, the railways were a wonderful colonial scam, William. The railways were Invented built by a wonderful Scot, Lord Dalhousie, and, yeah, and exporting, well, and, 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 exporting and lovely, lovely engines from Glasgow to carry you, chug uh, you through the countryside. Well, not chug us through the countryside, chug <laughs> the British <laughs> through the countryside, <laughs> and to <laughs> take Indian raw materials to the ports to ship them to England. The, the railways were not built in terms of response to supply and demand of the Indian public. They were built to serve British imperial interests. And what's striking is that they were also done on the basis of such outrageously generous terms to British investors, that it was actually ready money. It was the single most profitable investment available to, 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 to the British public for about three decades, during which time the interest rates were so high, paid for entirely by Indian taxes, that a mile of railway in India cost more than double the same mile of railway in Australia and Canada. And what's more, the, 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 these, uh, these uh, I mean, the, the, at the time the expression used was this was private enterprise at public risk, but it was British private enterprise at Indian public risk. So even the railways, yes, we're happy to have the railways now, but we know why they were built and who they were built for. Uh, and the same applies to everything else. I mean, it's, it's a bit rich after 200 years of, of enslaving, imprisoning, torturing, maiming, blowing people off the mounts of cannons, as happened after the so-called Indian mutiny, all of that, that the, some British people celebrate the fact that India is democratic at the end of it. Well, no, thank you. You know, we had to to seize that democracy democracy for ourselves. I, if there's any lingering um, uh, empire nostalgists in the audience, please uh, uh, ask your uh, save this for question time and uh, you come back. I'm I'm not going to uh, argue with Shashi on this one since I substantially agree with him. Um, but I would be disappointed if we don't have a few uh, uh, diehard Tweedy questions, please, from the audience uh, before the uh, uh, evening's out. Um, now this is. In an odd sort of way, got you in trouble yet again with your bosses because it was praised by the, the, the your your uh, enemy, uh, Mr. Modi of the BJP, the, the prime minister, the man who just wiped out your party. Has that made life difficult? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the fact is that um, I don't think there's anything that I said that anybody in my party disagrees with. No fan letters from Sonia, though. <laughs> uh, no, not too many fan <laughs> letters, but I don't think there's any opposition hostility to it. However, uh, the BJP. Prime Minister chose on a, at a public event, well attended by media, to uh, express his appreciation of these remarks. And that, needless to say, uh, in the in the hothouse world of Indian politics, Indian media immediately generated speculation that I was about to jump ship or whatever. Can I give you the upset. opportunity to deny this? Or, 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 totally. Uh, uh, I mean, anyone would suggest that I would go off and join the BJP. Uh, doesn't not only doesn't know me, but hasn't read sort of a, a my rather extensive paper trail. I mean, I've published 15 books. Uh, uh, they, they, they embody a set of values, uh, particularly about Indian pluralism, which are at odds with everything that Mr. Modi and the BJP stand for. So to explain to an audience who may not know the minutiae of Indian politics, um, in the last general election, India suffered as great a sea change as Scotland has just done in its last general election, in exactly the same way that the Labour Party was wiped out here, the Congress Party uh, was wiped out. And, and from what was the highest number of seats the Congress Party ever had? Oh, I did speak. I mean, Rajiv Gandhi had, had as many as 413 in a 543 member parliament. And now 44. But yes, the, yeah. this is much lower than the lowest we've ever had. Could you talk about why you think that happened? Why did the party you represent? Well, suffer there were a this number of factors. Terrible? I mean, the, 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 the negative factors were, first of all, anti incumbency, which is a, a classic feature of Indian electoral behavior. Uh, throw the rascals out is the reflex. Uh, and in this uh, case, there was, there was a massive um, series of corruption. Well, I've come scandals. into that yeah. in a minute. But anti incumbency as, as a general principle, because in the US, for example, to the US House of Representatives, the US Congress, the average re election rate in the last 50 years is 96%. 
Whereas in India, to the Lok Sabha, the average re-election rate is 26 <laughs> percent. So uh, it's 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 a miracle to get re-elected by and large. I mean, there are a few who manage it several times. But that but just implied though, that it's more MPs are busy feathering their nests than the, the, that's, the prosecuting. That's part. And the then secondly, you're quite right. Corruption became a big issue. There was a very popular mass movement led by a saintly Gandhian figure, uh, which brought the center stage. He had saturation coverage on television, uh, and so people were very conscious of it. And and, and not that the Congress Party is any more corrupt than the BJP or anyone else, sadly, in the very corrupted world of Indian politics. It's simply that being the ones in power, the, uh, they got tarnished with that particular brush much more than the opposition did. The opposition represented the hope of change. The government seemed to embody, in the eyes of these people, what was wrong with the system. So corruption didn't help. Inflation didn't help. Uh, when the Congress Party came to power, when the UPA, as the United Progressive Alliance, of which we were the centerpiece, came to power, the oil was $40 a barrel. And the Indian rupee was 40 to the US dollars. And one US dollar was 40 Indian rupees. By the time the UPA finished, oil was $140 a barrel. And the, the, the rupee had gone down to 60, which meant that uh, the increase in, in price of, of, of each dollar was costing the Indian consumer 50% more. And it, it had gone up by $100. You can imagine that just passing some of the government tried to absorb some of this, but passing it on to the consumer turned everybody against us. I mean, I've had exchanges on Twitter with people saying, if the oil price goes up once more, if the petrol price goes up once more at the pump, I'm voting for the BJP. And I reply saying, do you think the BJP could do any differently? But anyway, we did lose those votes. And finally, there why, were a lot why of... Why is Indian politics as corrupted as it is? Because it is very low on the Transparency International level of corruption. It, it, it's, it's, it's very, very troubling. And I'm not sure there's any easy answer to it because it's certainly grown in the years. I was, you know, I, went, uh, I left India after, after college, went abroad, did my doctorate, and then joined the United Nations. And I've only just come back to India in the last six years. And I'm horrified by what I see because it's much, much worse than the India that I grew up in. Um, part of it definitely is politics itself. And politics has become the fount of corruption precisely because um, of, of our own desire to be, to be um, uh, shall we say, equitable. And the whole idea is the official ceiling on how much you can spend per candidate in an election is deliberately kept very low, uh, many would argue unrealistically low, uh, in order to ensure that anybody can contest uh, an election. But the problem then is that what people actually spend or their parties spend or their supporters spend on the election... It's usually more. ...is not just more, it's 20 times more. It's very often 30 times more. And all that extra money is, has to be unaccounted for. In other words, there's, there's what we call black money sloshing around the system at election time. And, in the last and that election, has to be generated in order to be able to spend it. In the last election, overwhelming, huge corporate support for Mr. Modi with massive posters, every single poster huge. slot across I mean, India. I, I, it's yeah. been estimated that, that the Indian election, that the BJP's election budget uh, was comparable to the entire cost of a U.S. presidential election <laughs> in just straightforward conversion terms, not purchasing power parity. In other words, it was over a billion dollars was estimated. Now, during elections, that's a huge spurt to the economy, but it's also, uh, I'm afraid, uh, an awful lot of corruption. So that's political corruption. Then there's corruption at other stages, our, our bureaucratic processes, um, unfortunately. Uh, you, you know, people like to profit from the power to permit. So the more regulations there are, you can actually collect something to 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 permit or to or to or to the make permit an exception Raj, for. As it's called. Uh, well, liberalisation that the Congress Party introduced in 1991 is reducing right. the number of permissions required, but there are still too many. And then, of course, you've also got uh, corruption in things like real estate transactions. Nobody anymore sells or buys a piece of land or a house or a flat uh, at the actual value. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody, but large numbers of people don't. What they do is they declare a lower value so that the, uh, the, the stamp tax payable is, is that much lower and so on, and they pay the rest in black money. Now, all of this, all these practices have generated a parallel economy, which some would argue is as large as the real one. So if India claims that its total GDP today is about $2 trillion, which is what we claim, the reality may well be four. Uh, but the fact is that it's because so much of it is unaccounted for in this, in this rather sleazy way. Now, the the uh, election of Modi let on to the stage in India a man from a very different background to, to most of India's previous leaders. Like Nehru, most in the past, um, 
embracing a, a, a left leftist agenda, um, and Modi, born and brought up in in the RSS, an extreme right wing organization, modelled on on the kind of Hitler Youth and the Falange movements and fascist movements of the 30s. Um, what do you think he represents for India? And why suddenly have India has in, have Indians overwhelmingly embraced this? this ideology, which is so different oh, I, from everything. They haven't embraced the ideology. What's interesting is, yes, he, did come, from man who he came from this uh, background, but uh, became chief minister of a state. Chief minister is the state equivalent, is, uh, what the Scots call first minister. So he became chief minister of the state of Gujarat. We, we, we don't regard ourselves as a region. We regard ourselves as a country. Um, well, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> as I said, it's our equivalent of a first minister. But anyway, um, uh, so... so um, uh, as chief minister, he actually developed a reputation for being an efficient and relatively honest administrator, as well as somebody who was committed to the to making it easier uh, for businessmen to come in and invest and grow the economy, so that in fact the rate of growth in, in Gujarat was rather healthy. And in the campaign, he actually sold himself much more as somebody who could be trusted to help India's economy grow rather than as somebody who was pushing the um, the Hindutva agenda, the Hindutva, the Hindu chauvinist agenda, if you like, which the RSS... And in fact, barely mentioned religion or Islam or Muslims or the minorities at well, any point I in the Well, I think he did, make, he did make enough uh, uh, nods and allusions to that agenda for the faithful. But his overall message was one of he would be the CEO India was lacking, and he contrasted himself to the outgoing prime minister, who was a gentleman by then in his early 80s, um, uh, very soft-spoken, in fact. Uh, totally silent. Uh, or sometimes <laughs> silent. Uh, very respected economist, but not somebody who, uh, who could be seen as sort of inspiring the masses, whereas Modi is a very eloquent speaker in Hindi. And didn't and, you, I and, mean, honestly, didn't you feel that the last Manmohan Singh administration was a complete car crash? He was seen to be weak. He was seen to be dominated by Sonia, who wasn't elected. Um, I mean, it was a it was a catastrophe. Well, with hindsight, one could say I, I, at the time it didn't feel like that, but it did feel as if an awful lot of things weren't being done that could have been, and a lot of things, you know, we were we were doing that we shouldn't have. So yes, it, I can't say it was it was it was uh, the best possible time, but the results on the ground were actually not bad. I've got a piece up on the BBC site uh, from uh, Manmohan Singh's 80th birthday a couple of years ago when they invited me to assess his tenure in which I've argued that he's actually made a lot of very, very positive changes for India. And I was credibly able to argue that the lives of Indians were better for the 10 years of Manmohan Singh's prime ministership uh, in demonstrable, provable ways. Uh, I won't waste to, to quote, everyone's time. But to here. quote, in a sense, a different side of things, um, towards the end of Manmohan Singh's um, reign, uh, um, the celebrated Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen with Jean Dres produced a remarkable book of statistics on the Indian economy. And I'll just read some of the things, because this came on the background of, uh, of a period when, um, under Manmohan Singh, India had been growing at 9%, uh, was hailed as a new potential superpower. Um, there were stories of how um, the, it had gone in, in, a few, in a few years from three to 100 million cell phones, from uh, uh, the 100 million engineers a year were being produced in Indian universities. But suddenly, uh, um, Manmohan Singh started pointing out things like the fact that a quarter of Indians were still illiterate, a third were without electricity, and half didn't have toilets in their house. Uh, and so there was, I think, th th there was a, a large scale feeling that India which had built itself up to become, I believe that it was imminently becoming a superpower, felt enormously disappointed. Is that fair? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I never quite believed the superpower nonsense. As I pointed out a few years ago in one of my many controversies, I said, how can we be a superpower when we're still super poor? Uh, the fact is we have all these challenges. Uh, but, you know, if you look at those numbers, What's you have to ask where we came from. 69% of Indians live on less than $1 a day. That's right, yeah. but it was 90% when the British left in 1947, um, uh, below the poverty ago, line. Uh, and no, but the yeah. poverty line is below a dollar a day. So in fact, if you look at the poverty line, it's now 27% from the 90 it used to be. Uh, similarly, British left us with 17% literacy. The fact that it's now 75 is actually a vast improvement. It's not good enough. 
It's not nothing. There's no grounds for complacency, but there has been progress made. And that's the point I keep saying. You know, Manmohan Singh's economic policies pulled about 10 million people a year out of poverty. Now, that's not inconsiderable. It's dwarfed by China, but no other country in the world comes close in terms of success in tackling poverty. How would you rate, you know, it's now a year into Modi's rule, how, how would you rate his performance in a year, a long time in politics? Yeah, well, there's this wonderful Texan expression, you know, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> and I think that's unfortunately what we see with Mr. Modi. He is, he is somebody who really talks a good game. He's a wonderful speaker in Hindi, uh, fluent, compelling, uh, full of ideas. There's nothing particularly wrong with what he says. In fact, he's been careful not to put a foot wrong, not to live up to the stereotypes we all painted of him as this demon who was going to be bashing the minorities and who was going to be uh, hostile and divisive. His, his language has been, in every respect, exemplary. But it's simply not been followed by any, any credible action. In fact, the gap between his rhetoric and the reality on the ground the announcement of, of, of impressive schemes uh, without a credible budget, an implementation plan, an execution capacity to actually get them done, uh, all of this uh, has actually caused more disappointment than if sort of a relatively silent prime minister had bumbled on because, you know, you, you, don't, have, you don't raise people with these soaring heights of rhetoric and then let them down by failing to deliver anything on the ground. A year ago, it looked as if your party was completely sunk. It had had its worst ever historic That's election right. result. A year on, are you feeling a little bit more hopeful? Oh, very much so. I mean, I think if he carries on like this, and we're only a year into a, a five-year term, if he carries on like this, I can't see him going back credibly to the electorate and asking for a second term. I mean, he, there's, there's literally not one of his campaign promises uh, has moved on at all. I mean, he won a lot of votes by promising young people jobs. He's done absolutely nothing to generate new jobs in the economy. Um, he's, he's talked about various uh, schemes, but most of these are existing schemes of our government, repackaged, but undoubtedly more attractive labeling and, 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 and you know, sound bites and, and photo ops, but uh, without any, any substantial difference. And in many cases, with lower budgets that have been allocated to them by our government. If, so, if I was a BJP MP trying to explain away the lack of action by, by Modi, one of the defences, surely, I would mount against you would say that your party has uh, behaved in, in a very disruptive manner in Parliament and has been carrying placards and protests into the Lok Sabha. How would you reply to that? And therefore, no, uh, obstructing the possibility of him passing any that's laws. That's true, and I, I truly regret that the, the Congress Party is, is emulating the BJP's own behaviour in opposition. Uh, the new golden rule in our politics appears to be do unto them what they've done unto you. So this has been going on and it's not healthy. But having said that, uh, there are a lot of things that don't require legislative action that Mr. Modi hasn't done. There's a great deal of regulatory action. For example, he makes a big fetish out of the importance of the ease of doing business. Uh, he's, he's frequently said in his campaign speeches and since becoming prime minister that in, it's a shame that India is 142nd in the World Bank's ease of doing business index and he wants to see it going up to at least 50th, he says. But the fact is that he's actually not uh, rewritten a single regulation, simplified a single rule, require, no, removed a single onerous uh, requirement. He makes a pretty speech 11 months ago bemoaning the fact that it takes uh, an Indian... Uh, 200 steps and permissions to actually open a store. Uh, and he points out that in America it only takes six. Well, 11 months later, it still takes 200. He's done nothing about actually following up on his brilliant insight. It's sort of almost like you know somebody gives him a soundbite, he thinks it's a great idea, he speaks it. He gets the soundbite and moves on to the next soundbite. So the country has to change, and he's, he's squandering this extraordinary majority he won in the last election. How big a threat to India's pluralism do you think... Uh, Hindutva and, and the RSS really represents. Uh, India is this incredibly diverse country with so many different religions, so many different ethnic groups and languages, uh, and yet he is, is often perceived as being very much behind the, uh, the, the right wing of the Hindu majority. That's right. Very, uh, refused to, famously refused to wear a Muslim skull cap at any point in the election campaign or, uh, or do anything to, to win over the Muslims. Do you, see, do, you see, do you think that's been overplayed? Because we haven't actually, we've seen a few church burnings, the odd religious riot, but nothing compared to the sort of thing that's going on in the 1980s. Well, first of all, uh, there's no question that the RSS does stand for this sort of thing. There are, if you like, two ideas of India. There's the idea best encapsulated by Jawaharlal Nehru and by most of the founding fathers of the freedom movement who really saw India as a land for everybody, and particularly in the face 
of a separatist movement that led to the creation of Pakistan as a state for India's Muslims, um, we never fell into the trap of arguing that therefore what remained was a country for India's Hindus. We insisted that Muslims were just as welcome as indeed were anybody else who belonged or chose to belong to India's soil. And so indeed we have this rich diversity and, and plurality. Although in, in, in practice, for example, my middle class Muslim friends in Delhi find they can only rent houses in certain colonies where other Muslims live, that, that on a general social level, it's still difficult. That varies. To Again, be, there uh, are enlightened yeah. landlords and there are, there are bigots, but that's true, sadly, in every country. Um, perhaps uh, Muslims face it worse because of the, the ever-present threat from Pakistan and the fear of, that you might be renting your apartment to somebody who's incubating a bomb. I mean, all this nonsense. Yeah. But I'm just saying there is that, that kind fear. of bigotry or fear as well, and that makes it worse. But, uh, but it's, it's by no means universal. However, it's real. Uh, at the same time, there are very many prominent Indians in every walk of life who are Muslim. Uh, we've had two presidents who are Muslim. We've had uh, all our top movie stars, a couple of our cricket captains. One of the uh, big um, tech guys, uh, one Azim Premji. Azim Premji, who yeah. was briefly India's richest man, now is second or third. So it's, it's not that we don't have, I mean, that Muslims lack opportunity to rise uh, in India, and, and they do so and they can, but I agree with you that we're far from perfect and there are problems. Nonetheless, this pluralism and diversity goes to the heart of one idea of India. And then you've got this other idea of India that the RSS, uh, uh, which Mr. Modi belonged to from the age of 17, I think it was, uh, profoundly believes in. And this is an organization that argues that India is fundamentally a Hindu nation, that everyone in it lives in the sufferance of the Hindus and must acknowledge their, their Hinduness uh, in order to be allowed to remain, which is a, a preposterous idea to many of us, but which is at the core of their, of their beliefs. And they tend, unfortunately, to ally these beliefs to a sort of martial spirit. They're, they have these uh, units with young men in khaki shorts parading with bamboo staves every morning at 6 o'clock. Based on the Hitler Youth, originally. Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, they argue, this is a, because I've made this argument myself, that the, this is based on the fascist movements of the 1920s and 30s. They argue, uh, and it's not inaccurate, that they actually modeled on Baden Powell's Boy, Boy Scouts. Scouts. Which, <laughs> they also wore khaki shorts. the model for the Hitler Youth. The khaki <laughs> shorts. Well, so the question is, is it the Boy Scouts or is it, but anyway, uh, I'm afraid the British <laughs> colonial police okay. also wore khaki yeah. shorts. So, <laughs> we, we, we can, we can debate this, but anyway. Uh, the fact still is, nonetheless, that, that the, 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 the implied threat of a sort of militarized, chauvinistic, Hindu nationalist uh, force in power. Uh, and it goes beyond just being in power. It, it, it then influences other things, other appointments, for example, because the patronage network is, is vast. Uh, we've had the Indian Council of Historical Research, a number of cultural bodies, and so on, all being... Uh, replaced, but, uh, not just infantry, people have been asked to resign from these positions and are being replaced by people who have actually served in the RSS. That's been their principal qualification. We have the National Book Trust, for example, which is headed by a, an Indian novelist with 17 novels to his credit. He was asked to step aside and was replaced by the former editor of the RSS House magazine, um, who had no book to his credit, and he's now the head of the National Book Trust. I mean, this sort of thing is very worrying. And, and, universities, uh, uh, universities, museums, museums uh, yeah. you name it. I mean, uh, uh, all sorts of all sorts of things. And Mr. Modi himself um, has condoned some of the most outrageous minority bite, baiting statements by prominent members of his party, Give some examples, including yeah. two members of his council of ministers. Uh, and, and some of his prominent MPs, and he has no, he's himself not said a wrong word since G becoming Give an Prime example Minister. of the sort of thing yeah, well, I mean, there's One chap said that anybody who doesn't support Mr. Mr. Modi should move to Pakistan, thereby implying they'd have to be Muslim to do that. Um, uh, another, uh, and this chap is a minister of state. Another minister of state said um, uh, that uh, in, in, it was an election speech, admittedly, but nonetheless, she said that the country, the two kinds of people in the country, Rams are there and Harams are there. Rams are there are worshippers of Ram, the Hindu god. Harams are there are bastards. <laughs> so uh, this was this is so those are the only two choices you have for the kind of Indian you want to be. She should have been asked to resign on the spot. Uh, you know, we all made a huge fuss in Parliament, but she continues. So you've got um, uh, uh, you an egregious India tolerance for the kind of talk that would not have been uh, admissible in Indian politics till Mr. Modi's ascent to power. Do you think India is in danger of succumbing to that kind of language, or do you feel it's still a very small minority? I think it's a small minority, but it's dangerous that they're allowed to run as loose as they have. Uh, and, and I don't think they speak for a majority of Hindus. Hindus are a famously eclectic and tolerant people, so they're not going to put up with 
this kind of thing for much longer, I believe. And I think it'll cost them more votes than it'll consolidate. If uh, internal threats are, are one thing, obviously the other uh, big issue in India today is, is the external threat. Uh, and your, your, your um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, uh, your half-brother, um, uh, Pakistan. <laughs> Brother enemy, I call uh, them um, in the chapter of my book, Pak Syndica. Pakistan, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, when I first went out to live in India as a young correspondent, I, India was, things were often sort of, you know, government run, shoddy, falling apart, you couldn't get foreign goods. And I remember going across the border to Pakistan to get things like Duracell batteries, um, Coca-Cola, all sorts of things you couldn't get in India. 25 years on, so the rest, uh, in, India is now, however, however disappointing some of the recent growth has been. It's it is a fast growing economy. It, it, uh, a few years ago, it was growing each year by the size of the Pakistan economy, uh, the total economy. Um, and Pakistan, meanwhile, seems to be disintegrating into ever greater internal lacerations with Taliban fighting the government, the ISI fighting the army. Uh, uh, what do you what do you see as the possible do you see any optimism there with Pakistan? Is it, I mean, it seems it seems it's, a very, very unhappy state at the moment. It's very difficult to be optimistic, William, because there's an existential problem with Pakistan. You know, as to paraphrase Voltaire on Prussia, uh, in India, the state has an army. In Pakistan, the army has a state. Mm. And the army in Pakistan, essentially, um, needs to justify its grossly disproportionate share of national resources. I mean, no, con no army in the world uh, spends a, a larger percentage of that country's GDP or regular budget. Do you know budget. the figures? What are the uh, figures? I, I don't, but the official figures are 12% uh, of, 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 of the Pakistani budget. But in fact, uh, there are lots of hidden elements as well that, that don't show up in the official figures, uh, including the various clandestine services and the militancies that have been financed and, and even officered in many cases by, by the Pakistani official establishment. So you've got a state that has this problem, that wants to keep hostility going on both sides. Today's news is the uh, uh, much touted meeting of the two countries' national security advisors has been called off by Pakistan. So, I mean, they have an interest in hostility and the civilian governments in Pakistan rather haplessly seek opportunities to, um, to uh, uh, make peace with India because you can see the obvious advantages, not least economically. But the military draws the red lines and since the military has ruled Pakistan for half its existence, uh, it's difficult for any civilian leader who values his seat uh, to to uh, not pay heed to the army's blandishments. But some have argued that, uh, you know, without in any way whitewashing the Pakistani military establishment uh, and, and the, what all the forgies have done, some have argued that India is the big brother as, as the much, much more powerful nation with a much larger population and the much larger army, in a sense, should take the first step and go... Uh, and make the extra, go the extra mile. We must. I mean, that's yeah. my view as well. I've argued in my book, Pax Indica, India and the World of the 21st Century, that we really should uh, have an asymmetrical policy to Pakistan, should give them far more than we, we get. In fact, um, I'm all in favor of, of liberalizing as much as possible. But to give you one example, we unilaterally extended most favored nation treaty status to Pakistan, unilaterally, in 1995. 20 years later, Pakistan is still not reciprocated, so that we are the only example in the world of a one-sided, most favored nation arrangement. Uh, so India makes these gestures with Pakistan, uh, as I say, I mean, for but them- potentially for the future, if you were to get over this difficulty, there is such economic benefit for Pakistan exactly. in, a, in a trade relationship, an, an open road to Afghanistan, motorways up to Central Asia. Possible pipeline from yeah, Iran through all this Pakistan, stuff. all of that. Uh, but they don't see that. I mean, they, they just- But they would argue that India, India is often, I mean, many of India's neighbors would argue that India has, often been the, the big brother of the region, that it has bullied its neighbors, it has bullied Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, as well as Pakistan. Um, and um, w would you agree with that in the past? Well, I think we, we haven't been blemish free, but then ask the Mexicans what they think of the Americans. I mean, every But, that, but again, I mean, there's a, there a measure, measure of truth in both. Yeah, I mean, but you look, look at South Asia, for example, the, the, the seven countries plus India around the table, and uh, India uh, accounts for 70% of the population and 80% of the GDP uh, of all these countries put together. Inevitably, it displaces more weight. Uh, I agree sometimes it, 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 it perhaps has come across as somewhat heavy-handed, but it can, it can and should, in my view, be far more generous to the neighbors. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, a prominent advocate of a more generous policy. In fact, very recently, we signed a, a land boundary agreement with Bangladesh that ended some of the 
anomalies of partition. Uh, and, and we did so on terms that were far more generous to Bangladesh than to India, but it was the right thing to do. And as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I steered it through my committee unanimously. I should say at this point that Shashi has written a book on his view on, on foreign relations, Pax Indica, which isn't available in the bookshop, but is available on Amazon. I, this I, bookshop yeah, had, yeah. had a bit of bad luck, unfortunately, getting some of my books. But um, there's, I think, one volume which I edited rather than wrote that's available. But the rest are uh, on, 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 online, yes. We're yeah. reaching the end of our time. But um, looking forward, looking to the future, um, Aravind Adiga wrote in a review recently that he thought that India's biggest problem uh, was overconfidence, that it already believed that it would, was on the verge of becoming a superpower when there was a huge amount of work to be done. You'd, you'd probably agree with that, wouldn't you? Well, I, I think some have been boosting uh, beyond the, the sort of the, the, the reach of reason. It doesn't really make sense for us to imply that we are capable of some sort of um, uh, superpowerdom, as I said earlier. But also, I think it's important for us as a, uh, a country to recognize that there's simply too much wrong for us to be complacent. That we have a large number of internal problems to settle. And even whether we grow at 9% or 7% or whatever percent we come up with, uh, we still have to worry about that bottom 25% of our society who are living in conditions you know, below a poverty line drawn barely this side of the funeral pyre. So there's an enormous amount that needs to be done. And, and, and I think if we can focus on those problems first, uh, we can worry about projecting ourselves uh, uh, in, in, in other ways later. And I think these problems have to be focused on. Just to embarrass you before you uh, before we, I let loose the questions, um, many would argue that um, you have in the, in the BJP a party that's come to power partly because your party, the Congress party, which, which in so many ways has views that we should all agree with, it's, it's plural, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, in a whole variety of ways, it's a, it's, it's a, a one, has wonderful ideals, and yet it has this, many would argue, appalling leadership, that the Gandhi family uh, have, uh, have run it into the ground, that Rahul is a fool, Ooh. that Sonia is, um, uh, that Sonia is, uh, is uh, 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 acts undemocratically. Um, and would you want to defend them? Yes, I would, <laughs> most certainly. Um, no, look, the, the, the Congress Party... And also, and more specifically, she hasn't allowed a new generation to come up and, and fill... I mean, you are now in the, your, uh, heading towards your... Yes, yes, uh, grand old years. Grand uh, old years. Eligible um, for senior Not as young senior as you once were, and, and should be now sort of foreign minister, I mean, in, in a well, just world. Well, in a just world, we should be in power, and then I could have a crack at that. But, but no, the truth is that, um, that uh, the Congress Party does actually... Uh, have far more talent in its ranks than the BJP does, as is painfully apparent during Parliament question hour. You can see the ministers are literally in over their heads for the most part, with a handful of exceptions in the BJP. Uh, the Congress Party, therefore, is not dependent on one leader to the extent the BJP is. It has a depth of leadership, and, and it's a consensual leadership that the Gandhi family is trying to bring forward. Secondly, the generational change you talk about is, I think, imminent. I mean, I don't know when, but I expect in a matter of months rather than years, you will see a younger generation taking over the reins, and that will probably feature Rahul Gandhi as the president, but with a, with a that, cohort of Does that of fill others. you with delight, that prospect? He's, he's, I... he's really had a, a bum rap, as the Americans say in the press. He really isn't uh, the person who's caricatured uh, uh, in, in the press. He's actually smart, intellectually curious, fairly charismatic, very good-looking, attracts young people wherever he goes, and, and, and he has this actually... This is the first moment where I'm beginning to... Uh, You're beginning uh, to... Lose <laughs> faith in your judgment, actually. Listen, I, I, mark my words, the electorate will prove us right. I won't argue with you with the British Empire, but I can't have you say that about Rahul, whose performance on television in his first uh, television debate, he repeated the same line 11 times. We want to introduce young people and bring more women. And it was as if he was on drugs or something. What was going on there? <laughs> let, me, let me say that you know everyone's entitled to... Uh, horror story in their political past. But the Rahul who has been campaigning through the country in the last three or four months um, has really made a tremendous impact. I suspect you've been away for part of that time, Willie, but in all fairness, um, I've seen him uh, strike the right note repeatedly. I've seen him do it in Parliament, where he's been far more eloquent than in the past. I think he's really coming into his own, and I think he's actually going to get stronger and more effective 
uh, as we've seen in the last few months uh, in the years ahead. So, and is it a good I, if I were Modi, I would worry. That the, the same party, the, your party, this great party that's done so much in Indian history, started, of course, by a Scot, um, yes, Alan Octavian indeed. Hume, Alan Octavian um, Hume. should be led by one, only one family. No, but you see, the family's claim to that leadership is partly historic, that is, the, the DNA of the party being inextricably linked with the Nehru's and Gandhi's, but it's also partly the, their electoral appeal. I mean, whether we like it or not, and I recognize that some of you don't like it, uh, the fact that a, a Gandhi is coming and seeking votes uh, actually sways an awful lot of voters. It didn't last time. When it and if it's, well, well, that's true, but the fact is that uh, uh, we've won elections every time we've lost a couple, we will come back and won the next few. So uh, the feeling is that, um, that, that, the, that you know, a, a, a change of personnel in terms of generation, but a continuation of the same brand, as it were, will actually serve the party well. Now, it has, it has to be tested at the ballot box. That's a wonderful thing about democracy. So let's see whether I'm right or you are. And if he fails again next time, would you, would you vote to throw him out, to throw a palace coup or something, Patashi, or what? <laughs> you know that uh, <laughs> sitting on the stage and discussing hypotheticals uh, is not a very wise thing to do, particularly the video camera rolling. Luckily, I think but let me say, <laughs> let me say that we expect to win the next election, so the question will not arise. Well, Shashi Thiru. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have time for a few questions? Uh, they say finish, but I, that means, I think, two quick questions. Please, one ch person challenge Shashi on Empire. Any, any Tweedy, well, four or five Empire nostalgists? Them. Andrew, no. I'm not mentioning the Empire. We're in the year of the 50th anniversary of the 1965 Indo-Pakistan War, and there's some plans for a jamboree on the date of the end of the war um, by the Indians, which has caused some controversy. And I just wondered, in the context of the fact that uh, I read an academic the other day talking about how China, it's in China's interest to have, you know, if you've got the bigger brother India and the smaller brother Pakistan, then, then China likes to see itself as a parent with the bickering children. It's actually in their interest to have that going on. I just wondered, in your capacity as heading up the uh, Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the relationship with China? Yes, the relationship with China is actually hugely important. And it's a very interesting example uh, of something that I wish the Pakistanis would do vis-a-vis -vis us. We lost a war to China in 62 in rather humili humiliating ways. Uh, and we have the world's longest disputed frontier between our two countries. But we have, a, uh, we have agreed, and we are the aggrieved party, to put that on the back burner and develop other kinds of normal relations with China. So our trade has gone up 250 times in, in the last 24 years, since 1991, to the point where China is now, if you discount services, if you just dis discount manufactured goods, they're our largest single trading partner. It's about $70 billion of trade every year with China. Um, and, and we're now taking steps to to improve, uh, to make it easier for the Chinese to come and invest in our economy, uh, give them more of a stake in India's prosperity. They're now your biggest so, trading partner, aren't they? Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. I mean, the U.S. is, really, because you add both goods and services, but in goods alone, China is first. Um, so, so, so when you look at all of this, there is no question that this is an important relationship. At the same time, there are tensions arising from the unresolved frontier dispute and occasionally provocative statements from the Chinese side laying claim to an Indian state, Arunachal Pradesh, which they prefer to call South Tibet. And this is obviously something that we are, we are sensitive to and, and, and which will create, if you like, a certain level of, 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 of geopolitical and, and geostrategic concern between the two countries. We will see and we we'll continue to see China as a potential threat as long as this dispute remains unresolved. But China seems to not be in a big hurry to settle it. They've had something like 17 rounds of talks between envoys, the two countries on the border, and there's, there's very little progress. But at the moment, we believe that we are sufficiently well prepared that the Chinese will not embark on a military adventure. And meanwhile, trade and travel and investment and tourism can all grow. Kirsty. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting. It's, it's a topic you've not spoken about, and that is uh, sexual violence towards women in India. It was obviously very much highlighted by the terrible uh, rape and murder of uh, Jyoti Singh on the bus in December 2012 in Delhi. What are you doing about that, um, that sort of general issue of how women are treated? Right. Well, first of all, this is a genuine problem. It's right to highlight it. But it's also true that it's probably 
not as much worse as it's portrayed as being. Uh, it's simply that people are much more willing to talk about it now. I think a lot of these things were happening in the past and were brushed under the carpet. Now we are beginning to face our own demons. And so the awareness of it is itself partly a step towards tackling uh, the problem of violence against women. Now every, ro every rape gets reported. I'm afraid in the past uh, many women were too ashamed to go and report rape to the police and many police were reluctant to record it and investigations were lackadaisical and so on and so forth. That climate has changed now. Now we're determined as a society to do something about it. This tragedy happened when my party's government was in power. And, and we had a, a, a very clear strategy. We, we, we dramatically rewrote the laws uh, to increase uh, punitive uh, action against rapists and, and, and criminals. We redefined rape to make permissible a whole lot of uh, activities which um, in the past were getting off far too lightly from our judicial system. We uh, launched a campaign to have rape crisis centers in every state, and we also uh, created all women's police stations, or at least women police cells in police stations, so women could go and report to a woman officer if they wanted to complain so, about it. Some this. would argue that you overreacted, and that some, I mean, for example, if I make a, according to the law, if I make a sexual gesture at a woman, if I give somebody the finger in the street, I can go to jail for three years on the current law. Uh, the is, the is law is very tough, uh, but, you know, it's a law passed by Parliament unanimously. The, the present government was party to it, so uh, yeah. we'll see. I mean, the thing, again, is how effectively these things are implemented. It's early days yet. The incident you talked about was December 2012. The law was passed in April of 2013 or March of 2013, and we're now in, in the middle of 2015. But in the meantime, there's been a change of government. And one of the things that I, for example, have objected to in Parliament is how the budget for the rape centers has been slashed by, by, by this government um, to meet their fiscal targets. And so uh, we're, we're finding that, that some of the, uh, the objectives, they still declare the same objectives as our government did, but they're not prepared to finance them as effectively as ours had. And, and this worries me. Uh, but uh, consciousness is up, and there are these specific measures on that. There's a lot more that can be done and should be done. One last quick question, a short one, front here. Right, thanks for that. Um, that's the longest I've heard an Indian MP been, been speaking and not been interrupted, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no, I, I, Thank you, Willie. Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is about the, the aspirations of India in terms of uh, securing a, a permanent uh, seat in the UN. Actually, and that's been talked about so many times. So the reason why I ask this question is obviously we don't, we don't see India talk about foreign affairs or in, in a more prominent way now what's happening in the Middle East or Syria or anywhere. Um, when we don't do that, how can we keep doing uh, the other side and I, I ask for that to, to happen? Right. Well, uh, I don't know how familiar all of you are with this issue. The, there's been a demand for some years now to reform the UN Security Council. Uh, for, for obvious reasons, first of all, the council is relatively small. When it was set up, uh, it was 11 members out of a total UN membership of 51, so 22% of the UN was on it. Now uh, it's 15 members out of a total UN membership of 193, so barely 8%. Uh, secondly, Europe, with 5% of the world's population, has 33% of the seats on the council, and much as we love the Europeans, that does seem slightly unfair. And thirdly, there are five permanent members who happen to be there because they happen to have won a war 70 years ago, which is no longer a good enough reason to, to, to uh, leave them uh, in that position uh, without others who have contributed as much to world affairs in the years since the Second World War. So a number of countries initially was Japan and Germany who clamored for reform. Then the developing countries started saying, we're doing a lot too for the UN, uh, contributions to peacekeeping operations and all of that. And, and essentially, if the concept of permanent membership is uh, to have the countries without which the UN would not be credible, in other words, the indispensable countries, then surely a country like India, it is argued, should be a permanent member. Well, the problem is that the UN charter uh, has to be amended. And the threshold for amending that charter is, is so high that uh, the second and third largest contributors to the UN, Japan and Germany, are still called enemy states in the charter because it's too much of a problem to amend the charter. <laughs> now, this charter uh, requires a two-thirds majority in the General Assembly, 128 countries, to agree to a formula. And then it has to be ratified by 128 parliaments, including those of all five permanent members. So you need a formula that is acceptable to two-thirds of the world and is not unacceptable to the very countries whose powers would be diluted by a reform. You can imagine how 
how almost impossible that task is. So yes, one could argue that India should be on the council. Uh, the, the Japanese and the Germans say they should be on the council too. And one Italian foreign minister rather memorably cracked, what's all this talk about Japan and Germany? We lost the war too. <laughs> so, yeah, many countries are objecting. Um, uh, how do we, you know, uh, Brazil and Latin America, well, the Argentinians and the Mexicans don't like it. How do you choose uh, in Africa? Uh, from the largest democracy, Nigeria, the largest economy, South Africa, and the oldest civilization, Egypt. So it becomes a difficult task, and as, as a result, there's been no consensus. Boutros Ghali, the, the Secretary General in 1992, said that he hoped that the UN Security Council would be reformed in time for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. This year, we marked the 70th, and we're no closer mm -hmm. to UN reform. So um, I, think, I think this is a a question that will remain of academic interest for some time to come. But I do worry, and I say this not just as an Indian, but as a UN lifer. I spent 29 years at the UN. Uh, and to my mind, if the Security Council is not reformed, uh, the credibility of some of its decisions will sadly go down. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, sanctions being imposed on, on, say, one of the South Asian countries with which India has extensive trade uh, without India being consulted. Will India feel like honoring those sanctions when it directly affects its own economy? And you can extrapolate that story to, say, a Brazilian situation or a South African situation. The fact is that if the council wants to be credible and to uphold the principles of international law, it needs to adjust and accommodate itself to the changes, the geopolitical realities of 2015 rather than 1945. That's, that's my concern. If, if it doesn't happen and the council becomes less credible, the legitimacy of its decisions will be questioned, and all of us who benefited from the world order created uh, in 1945 with the Security Council of the UN at its, at its, at its, as its linchpin, if you like, uh, that world order itself, I think, will come seriously uh, into question. And so that's my big worry. It's something we should, we should talk about in future sessions of Beyond Borders. Already you're seeing the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, simply unable to accommodate the legitimate aspirations of a, an economy like China, let alone India. Uh, I mean, China has the same weighted vote in these institutions as Belgium. It's a joke, because these rules were written in 1945. Now, if you don't accommodate them, what happens? I mean, what the Chinese and the Indians and the others will say is, give us a level playing field, and if you won't, we'll go and construct our own playing field. And so you're seeing the new BRICS bank coming up and the new infrastructure bank coming up with the Chinese. And the result is quite likely that the, the international order we all rightly prize and celebrate will collapse, because not because anyone is really challenging it. This is not like the rise of Germany and Japan in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's because of the lack of imagination of the leaders of the existing system in their failure to accommodate these rising powers who simply want a place at the high table. They're not trying to overturn the table. They're saying, just make a little room for us in the chairs around the table, and we're not getting it. And that is something, I think, that potentially worries me because I am a great believer in the UN and in international organizations, and I think the world has been well served for 70 years but it needs some imagination and some statesmanlike spirit to ensure that it continues to serve us all well in the decades to come. Ladies and gentlemen, Sashi Thoreau. Thank you. <laughs>